Hey folks, are you ready for round number two of week four of GB102 Bible Backgrounds? Well, I hope so, because today we're going to take a little bit of a break from the pattern that we've established over the last two weeks. So, instead of talking about an ancient world superpower like the Egyptians or the Mesopotamians, today we're going to discuss three of Israel's neighbors that typically lived to the west on the coastal areas of the Levant, and that would be the Canaanites, the Philistines, and the Phoenicians. And to do this, we will need to be discussing just a little bit uh, of the archaeological data, what evidence remains of these people groups, and we will compare it with the biblical records uh, because there's a lot of overlap between these cultures, and so we're going to deal with all three of them together. And in many ways, scholars still debate where does one culture really stop? And another one begin. So let's try to tease some of that out. What makes a Canaanite a Canaanite, a Philistine a Philistine, and a Phoenician a Phoenician? All right, so let's begin by discussing the earliest of these three cultures, the Canaanites. So in terms of the biblical accounts, the people known as the Canaanites are in a class by themselves. And if I can be honest, this class is not very complimentary. While the Egyptians and the Mesopotamians, the Hittites and the Moabites, and yes, even the Edomites all received routine condemnation from various biblical writers, every now and then they did produce a good example. Uriah the Hittite, for example, proved to be a paragon of virtue, at least when compared to King David's philandering ways with his wife. The Mesopotamian eunuch who aids David and his friends so that they won't break their dietary laws of Leviticus shows to be an example of virtue even in a pagan land. And the Egyptian pharaoh, when he hears of Joseph's wisdom in interpreting his dream, he appoints him as top vizier of the country. And so, in many ways, the Bible doesn't make these people 100% bad guys, but they will with the Canaanites you'd be very hard-pressed to find an example of a good Canaanite in the scriptures. Not saying they don't exist, but you'd be very hard-pressed to find them. And after all, these Canaanites appear on the infamous list of sinful cultures that are exterminated by Joshua, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And so they are on a list of people that when Joshua comes into the land, he is to destroy them. Now, Judges chapter 2 verses 19 through 23 reveals that God specifically left some of these groups in the wake of the conquest, that Joshua didn't destroy them utterly. And one of those groups is the Canaanites. And specifically Judges chapter 2 informs us that they are left in the land so that they can test Israel's faithfulness to the covenant of the Lord. And well, more often than not, the Canaanites will be a stumbling block that Israel will fall over again and again and again. So, we can now ask the question, what made the Canaanite culture so bad? Well, as we discussed in our last lecture, the biggest problem was that the Canaanites presented a competing worldview that the Old Testament Israelites, for various reasons, found highly compelling. But this also raises the interesting question, why was it compelling? Why did the Israelites so frequently stumble into this trap of Canaanite-style paganism when they already had an exclusive relationship with the Lord, a God who had brought them out of Egypt? What was the appeal? What was the nature of this temptation? Or, I guess even more to the point, what was it about this Canaanite brand of paganism that trumped even other successful cultures' religions, like Mesopotamian or Egyptian religions? Let, let me, I guess, explain that further. Israel spent 400 years as slaves in Egypt, but the Bible doesn't really report all that often the Israelites worshiping the gods of Egypt, Osiris, Ra, or Isis. And likewise, Abraham's ancestry comes from the land of Mesopotamia, but we don't see the Israelites trying to reach back and worship his old gods of his previous family, like Marduk or Inki. This is the trend that we'll see throughout the Old Testament, that from the time of Joshua all the way to the time of the Davidic monarchy, the Canaanites' main storm god, Baal, is going to be Yahweh's chief and most significant competition for the hearts of the Israelites. 
Well, one of the most common explanations for Baal's appeal to the Israelite culture is this problem of linguistic proximity. You see, the Canaanite language is very close to Old Testament Hebrew, and this would have allowed for the easy exchange of ideas, unlike the Egyptian or the Mesopotamian languages, which are not as closely related etymologically and therefore allow for a harder translation of ideas. In fact, this uh, Canaanite language falls into the designation of Western Semitic languages, just like Hebrew does. And so, a possible modern comparison could be the relationship between the Spanish and the Portuguese language. They both come from Latin, and they are both very similar culturally with a lot of their vocabulary and verbs. In fact, these languages are so similar that a native speaker could converse even with just a little bit of difficulty, even if they'd never heard the language before. So, indeed, the similarities between Hebrew and the Canaanite languages are eerie. They will share the same alphabet. They'll share hundreds of root words and verbs, and even words for the deities. For example, the Hebrew word for the sun is Shemesh, while the Ugaritic word for the sun and the sun god is Shamesh. And the most potentially confusing of all the parallels is the name for the father of the gods in the Canaanite pantheon, El. You see, the Hebrew word for God is Elohim, and often it's just shortened to the name El. For example, in Genesis 17.1, God appears before Abraham and he introduces himself as El Shaddai. Shaddai means almighty, and El is a shortened form of Elohim, meaning God. And so, in the Canaanite religion, El could take the form of either a man or a bull. And I just find it very ominous that when Moses disappears for 40 days on Mount Sinai when he receives the law, the Israelites made an idol of a bull god. And Aaron proclaimed to the people, quote, This is the God that delivered you from Egypt. See Exodus 32.4. And hopefully by now you can see why the Israelites could be so easily confused, especially if they didn't have access to the scriptures or anyone who could teach them what they really mean. If they had just met a Canaanite walking along the way and they talked about their religions together, it would have been very easy for a Canaanite to see, see, we both worship El, don't we? And simply put, the similarity in languages made it very easy for the Hebrews to confuse their own theology with Canaanite theology. But another formidable aspect of Canaanite culture was their technology, or at least by late Bronze Age standards, they were far more advanced by the invading Israelites who were going to come into the land under the, under the leadership of Joshua. We have seen much archaeological evidence thus far that the Canaanites were living in the land as early as 3000 BC, and the remains of their late Bronze Age cities in particular are very imposing and show a lot of developments. And the problem that this sort of development made is that it can be seen and reflected in the reports that the spies that Moses sent into the land in Numbers 13 bring back. The spies go to these cities, they report back, they're seeing large high walls, heavy gates, and their people are armed with the best possible Bronze Age weapons, and the inhabitants are located in very strategic places so that they, if they have to attack, they won't go down without a fight. And this is going to scare many of the Israelites to no end. So, of course, we as Christians today, we can read these kind of texts, and we would kind of wonder, why does these Israelite spies have so little faith? Well, I mean, after all, they had traveled with God, who was speaking directly to Moses and showing himself personally in a cloud of fire and a pillar of cloud. Uh, they had food that was dropped on them every day except the Sabbath, called manna, and the Lord is literally making it drop from heaven. And presumably, everyone who's in their numbers has seen the Egyptian plagues for themselves. And they should have understood that the Canaanites are a weaker people group than the Egyptian forces that their God had just pummeled and humiliated. So why did they falter? Well, I think it's a testimony actually to the complexity and, uh, de and uh, advanced nature of the Canaanite culture. It was large, it was imposing, and looking at this set of problems only using human wisdom, 
the spies reported exactly what they saw. It would take a miracle to displace these Canaanites. And in some ways, they were right. But that is exactly what God was promising, that he would fight their battles for them. He would provide just such a miracle. So, of all the Canaanite technological advances that we read about in the Bible, the one that struck the most fear in the Israelites was the chariot. And I personally find it ominous indeed that even Joshua admits when he's telling the Ephraimites that they can take on the Canaanites in the valley, that yes, their chariots are strong, they're iron, iron rimmed, they are pretty much as advanced as you're going to get for this time. And he admits flat out, they're strong. And this would be a constant aspect of Israelite warfare throughout the course of the Old Testament, that God is going to purposely send the Israelites up against superior numbers superior technology, and even superior tactics of their enemies, just to show them that they cannot win a battle on their own. If they're going to be victorious at all, they're going to need to rely on God and his provision. And what we also see throughout this is that the Canaanites, because of their chariot technology, are going to be able to control places like the Jezreel Valley and the Plain of Akko, well into the time of the Davidic monarchy. Simply put, it's going to keep them strong enough and agile enough that they will be able to fight off Israelite attackers until Israel can present a unified front under the leadership of a king. Alrighty then, so let's switch gears as we are apt to do in this class and let's talk about the Canaanite pantheon, the various gods of the Canaanites. Well, we've talked a lot about Baal or Baal already, but he isn't the only game in town where it comes to Canaanites and what they worshipped. In particular, we're going to focus on the deities of the Canaanites that are mentioned in scripture and that presented a particular challenge to Orthodox Israelite beliefs. And so, the first Canaanite deity I'd like to discuss is Asherah, mentioned about 40 times in the NET version. Most references to Asherah involve either the creation of sacred groves of trees, or erecting a wooden monument known as an Asherah pole. Now, archaeologists have found numerous examples of these Asherah poles in Canaanite and Israelite towns, and this suggests that the worship of this, com this goddess was common throughout the Levant. For example, even down at um, the temple in Elephantine Island down in Egypt where a group of Jewish people will settle, they will build a temple, a competing temple to the god Yahweh, and in that temple is also an Asherah pole. And it's difficult to say why the Israelites thought that their god Yahweh needed or even wanted a wife, save that they were just very easily caught up in the rhetoric that sexuality leads to fertility in the human world, and they therefore thought there should be a parallel in the divine realm as well. And even today, we see critiques of Judeo-Christian monotheism that are similar to the Canaanite ideas from both neo-pagans and from some forms of feminism. The, that ba the basic comment is that referring to Israel's God only in masculine terms often leaves people wondering, where is the female equivalent? Where is the femininity in God? And, for example, it has become commonplace in some circles to speculate that Jesus was married, or that the Virgin Mary has been elevated to the status of co-redeemer. And so, even in Christian circles, from time to time, this idea of needing a female entity comes up very strongly. And in all of these cases, I would like to just say the challenge of Asherah remains strong and alive and well, even today. Alrighty, so let's go from talking about the feminine to something that's just downright scary. Let's talk about the Canaanite god Yom, who is the god of the sea and chaos. Now, in Canaanite iconography, Yom is almost always pictured as a huge, multi-headed serpent who swims around in the ocean. And Yom caused the oceans to be dangerous places, at least according to the Canaanites. Uh, he would wreck ships, he would send tidal waves. Basically, Yom was the source of all problems on the sea. And it is common for scholars to speculate that the Israelites were deathly afraid of the ocean. And for the simple reason, you don't see many stories of Israelites going out on ships. 
and the few that do almost always have something bad happen to them. Jonah finds a huge storm and is thrown overboard and swallowed by a great fish. Paul, in the New Testament, says that he's been shipwrecked at least three times. And so, oh, there's just this idea that while the Canaanites and other groups are afraid of Yom, um, or that they respect Yom, that the Israelites are just downright afraid of the sea, which is also called Yom in the Hebrew language. Now, additionally, scholars are going to note that there's many parallels between the descriptions of Yom and another biblical term, the Leviathan. Now, concerning all this, the Bible offers a consistent apologetic about the ocean and the chaos that's over the deep. For example, in Genesis chapter 1, when God begins creating, he speaks to the chaos, the tohu vabohu, the formlessness and voidness and he separates light and dark land from sea sky from ground and there's no cosmic wrestling match that god is simply just taking chaos and putting order to it likewise in psalm 74 verses 13 through 14 we see uh a we see what looks like a reference to a multi-headed leviathan which may be very similar to this God, Yom. And the significant point here is that God is making the claim, I can kill Leviathan whenever I want, and I can wash its dead carcass up on the beach right in front of the Canaanites. And I personally believe this rhetoric of the Bible is meant to accomplish two tasks when concerning the sea and any gods of the sea. The first is that it is to show the Israelites that their God is all-powerful even against the most chaotic forces you can think of. And the second point of this rhetoric is this, that the oceans, while they are still dangerous, are not a deity, nor are they controlled by a deity. The things of the sea may be big and scary and unpredictable, but they are not worthy of worship. So, moving on to the worship of things in the heavens, every pagan culture has a special place in their pantheon for the god of the sun. And for the Canaanites, that local sun god was known as Shamesh. And this particular god seems to have been a very clear problem for the Israelites, as passages like Ezekiel 8.16 point out, that even people living in Jerusalem, worshipping in the temple, had a practice of turning to the east, facing the sun, and bowing down to it. Now, unlike Baal and Asherah idols, we don't see much in the way of Shamesh idols coming up in Israelite cities, or the sun disk being displayed in Israelite artwork. And this may just be due to the ephemeral nature of sun worship, that the object of devotion really remains in the sky. And this is the constant testimony of the scriptures when we see uh, warnings about worshiping the sun, the moon, or the starry host, that Israel is warned, do not bow down to the object itself. And so, this matches what we see archaeologically. We don't see a lot of sun disks or moon uh, or moons drawn or stars on Israelite artwork. And it seems like the real challenge was that they were inclined to worship the object itself instead of worshiping God. So, let's talk about the scariest and possibly the most confusing god of them all in the Canaanite pantheon. The god Mot, the god of death. In the Baal cycle, Mot slays Baal at, at the start of the summer dry season, putting an end to the land's fertility until Baal is resurrected in the winter when the rains return. Now, Mot isn't just out to cause famine and drought. There are also quite a number of other calamities that could be attributed to Mot. For example, if a family lacked the ability to have children, or if a person just died of unexpected circumstances, these could all be believed that they were cursed by Mot. And it's difficult to say exactly how the ancient Canaanites pictured this deity, as we have few pictographic remains of the god Mot. And this may be an indication that, even among the Canaanites, Mot was more of a god to be feared than a deity to be worshipped by making an idol of it. So, it's largely been up to scholarly conjecture, but the general consensus is that Mot either looked like a skeletal figure, much like we would picture the Grim Reaper, or that he looked like a serpent, much like we discussed with the god Yom. Now, 
like the god Shamash, the word mot is also a Hebrew word. It's the Hebrew word for death. And this causes some very real interpretive problems whenever death is shown as being personified in the Hebrew scriptures, meaning that it's described with human-like characteristics and attributes. Because this could indicate a belief that death is not just an impersonal force of entropy, but that death is a creature or even a supernatural person. And many times in scripture we see references to the angel of death. For example, um, in uh, 2 Kings 19.35, we see the angel of death coming through and killing 185,000 Assyrian troops. And he does so at the Lord's command. So, unlike the Canaanite god Mot, which is one of the strongest gods of the pantheon, the angel of death pretty much is there just to do God's bidding. Now, Needless to say, all of these parallels between the Hebrew Old Testament and Canaanite cultural culture are very vast, and we could have probably talked about 15 other gods if time were allowing. But we've just given you this small sample here. If you do find the subject interesting, you can always read more about it in Arnold and Byers' text uh, entitled Re Readings from the Ancient Near East. Or if you want a more technical appraisal, you can try Ulf Oldenburg's text entitled Conflict Between El and Baal in Canaanite Religion. All right, so let's go from talking about the gods of the Canaanites, and let's move on to talk about the places where the Canaanites themselves fit into the biblical narrative. And, well, we might as well go big or go home. So let's start off this discussion by talking about this problem of holy war. The Canaanites are described in a list of seven people groups that are under the ban. This word ban is a translation of the Hebrew term haram. And this is a Hebrew word meaning that you, that you are to make a person or an object devoted to the Lord by destroying it. And other cultures like the Canaanites and the Moabites use this word too to describe a conquered city that they burn to the ground as an act of worship to a god of death like Mot or Shemosh. Now, in the Bible, this term is used to communicate the idea of holy war. And as texts like Deuteronomy 7, 1 through 4 make it clear, People placed under this kind of sentence are to be utterly destroyed. They are to be wiped out completely. And this meant not just killing combatants, but it also meant killing the elderly, women, and children. Indeed, Haram was supposed to be so complete that when a town was burned to the ground, you couldn't just take any plunder. It had to be burned as well, or it had to be devoted as an offering to the Lord. So simply put, any nation that is placed under the ban in scripture is scheduled for genocide. And the biblical reason for this is quite a, is a very consistent warning. If you don't destroy them, these people will turn your hearts away and you will start following other gods. Well, needless to say, this discussion of genocide has been a very ub ugly subject for our culture ever since the Second World War. And this has led many people, especially here in America and in Europe, to begin to question the, whether the God of Israel is entirely good or even worthy of worship at all because he commands his people to do such things, especially when women, children, and the unarmed are to be killed just as if they were armed and trained soldiers. Furthermore, this also raises a theological question of why does God tell the Israelites to destroy these people in the Old Testament because their religion could make them stumble and turn their hearts away, and yet he offers salvation to these same people groups in the New Testament through Jesus Christ? Why is there a shift in the paradigm? Weren't these pagan religions still potentially a detrimental threat to the true religion? Why destroy the Canaanites in the Old Testament, but offer to evangelize them in the New? And because of how tricky these questions are, there's been a large amount of apologetic work that's been dedicated to answering the questions of holy war. And so for the next few si slides, we'll look at some of the more popular defenses of these troubling biblical passages. So, probably the most common defense for the practice of holy war in the Bible is known as the Age of Accountability defense. Lee Strobel uses this book in, or uses this defense in his book, The Case for Faith, and the basic idea is that the children who die before they reach an age of moral accountability are not condemned by God. And this speculation is based on the idea that sin, for it to be sin at all, requires both cognitive and willful disobedience to either a person's conscience or the law of God if they've been given the law of God, and supposedly young children don't fit this criteria. 
Therefore, it is speculated that the Canaanite children who are killed in the holy wars described in the book of Joshua are saved and get to spend eternity in heaven for the rest of their life because they had not yet morally acquiesced to the sins of their culture. And this defense allows the holy war to have a silver lining of sorts because it ultimately becomes an act of mercy for such children. As the argument goes, these Canaanite children would have grown up to become pagans had not their lives been prematurely ended by the destruction of their city. Now, while this theory is probably the most popular explanation for biblical holy war here in America, it is unfortunately based on a lot of conjecture. There's no solid teaching. You can't point to a chapter or verse that says that this is where the age of accountability is, in either the Old or the New Testament. And personally, I believe that the, the actual theology of age of accountability is a church-age development that sprang up because of the question of whether or not the church was going to baptize infants. So, simply put, the concept of an age of accountability, while it's a reasonable theological co construct, is simply that. It's a theological construct inferred from the scripture rather than taught directly by the scripture. And furthermore, such an apologetic doesn't take away the sting that these children of evil parents are still being slaughtered and not being offered a chance to get to know Israel's God by being raised by a surrogate family, for example. So now, the second defense that occasionally makes the rounds when the debate of holy war crops up is frequently referred to as the sacrifice defense. And this idea is offered up usually by linguistic scholars who note that the word haram has a lot of semantic parallels with sacrificial terms, i.e. the word haram means to devote something to the Lord by destroying it. And this idea and in, or sorry, and in this reconstruction, a person who is killed by Haram, or a city that's been burned to the ground by Haram, has become holy, a sort of unwilling sacrificial victim that has been sacrificed for the benefit of the victim themselves. And the strength of this idea is that it offers hope to all of the people who are killed by the holy wars in the Bible. Simply put, in this reconstruction, if any Canaanites are killed by the Israelites as a through the course of holy war, no matter what their age, they were saved because their own blood atones for their sins. Well, needless to say, this theory does not mesh all that well with other biblical teachings that only a perfect sacrifice can atone for sin. A sacrifice like, for example, Jesus' death on the cross. And so... This theological construct ultimately relies on the assumption that holy war is a special dispensation. It only applies to people like the Canaanites for salvation, and that it only applied for a certain amount of time, and that time being when God specifically commanded the termination of a people group. So now, a third defense that has commonly come up throughout the course of Christian theology is known as the Deus Volt, or the God Wills It defense for holy war. And in this explanation of holy war, the question of, well, how can God allow such a thing to happen, is turned right back on the questioner. You see, numerous times in scripture, we see uh, prophets like Jeremiah or the Apostle Paul using the analogy of a potter to discuss a moral conundrum like this. Their conclusion is always the same, that God is a master potter and that he can do whatever he wants with his creation including making some pots simply for the reason of destroying them so that he can show off his wrath. And in this theological reconstruction, God made the Canaanites simply to be slaughtered by the Israelites. And to question this logic in the first place is to claim to know better than God. And sometimes this apologetic further relies on the conjecture that God is using his foreknowledge, that God knew the Canaanites would never repent, even if you showed them the truth, and so judgment is really the only reasonable alternative. Now, I'll admit, I don't like this reconstruction all that much simply because I'm not a Calvinist and I don't find these arguments all that compelling. But I will admit they do have a strength. The strength is it puts the real question of this whole problem front and center. Because when you ask, how can God let this happen, you are basically saying, do I have the right to criticize God for his actions? And this defense shoots that down. It says, no, you do not. You are a clay pot, and how dare you question what the potter is making you into? Now, I will admit, this argument has been quite popular throughout Christian history. 
but today it largely falls on deaf ears, at least on our culture. And the reason is that the people who are honestly wrestling with this question are not in any way, shape, or form comforted by the notion that God sounds a lot like the character Quina from Final Fantasy VIII, basically saying, I do what I want, you're the one with the problem. So, additionally, more militant skeptics also note that this defense is a cop-out of sorts because it avoids the question of whether or not God is morally trustable and instead focuses the blame back on someone who would dare to ask such a question. So, now the final apologetic I want to discuss when it comes to the problem of holy war is known as the exegetical archaeological defense. Many scholars of the Old Testament, such as, for example, Mark Zeese in his commentary on Joshua, note that only three cities are described as being burnt to the ground and destroyed in the book of Joshua. Those are the cities of Jericho, Ai, and Hazor. And this means that the bulk of the battles that are fought during the conquest are fought against armed combatants, and the destruction of unarmed women and children seems to be kept to a minimum in this theory. Now, archaeologically speaking, this does match what we see during the Late Bronze Age. We don't see many cities that have been burned to the ground and leaving burn layers, but we do see places like Hazor, places like Jericho, showing such burn layers, which seems to corroborate the evidence. Now, with all four of these theories, it minimizes the problem of killing, the in killing infants and unarmed people, but it does not get rid of the basic problem that God commands it in the first place. And so I'd like to conclude that idea by just saying, in short, there's quite a lot of work to be done if we're to still create a theologically and biblically sound view of the conquest of Joshua and the holy wars of the Old Testament, as all of the major apologetic reconstructions that we've discussed require a good deal of conjecture that we're reading into the scripture or making a theological assumption from scripture rather than being able to cite specific chapter or verse. Alrighty, so leaving the Canaanites behind, let's move on to the second major people group who lived on the coastal plains, and these are the Philistines. Now, we've already looked at the lands of the Philistines, which are the plain of Sharon and the Philistine plain back in the first week, so we really don't need to discuss their geography, but we do need to discuss their culture. And so let's correct that uh, omission now. And let's begin by saying, firstly, the Philistines are described relatively early in the biblical text. Abraham and Isaac both have run-ins with a Philistine king of Gerar named Abimelech. And in both cases, the patriarchs lied about the nature of their relationship with their wives because they were afraid the Philistines would try to kill them and take their wives away. So, the bulk of the 244 references to the Philistines, however, show up in the books of 1st and 2nd Samuel. And in this way, they prove to be the arch enemies of both King Saul and King David. So, why were the Philistines a particular thorn in the side of Israel for that time period between 1200 BC and 900 BC? And the answer to this can be found in a group of people that we saw in last week's lecture, the Sea People. Beginning around 1200 BC, mass migrations began taking place all over the Mediterranean and Aegean seas. And it's hard to know exactly what prompted these movements, but the current theory is that northern European tribes moved into the Greek peninsula and into Asia Minor, and from there, the sea people who were already living in those places got pushed out and began wreaking havoc all over the Mediterranean basin. By 1200 BC, the Mycenaean culture on the island of Crete was obliterated. By 1190 BC, the sea people were fighting the Egyptians in Lower Egypt, they were fighting the Canaanites in Phoenicia, and they're fighting the Hittites in Eastern Asia Minor. And historians call this time period the Bronze Age Catastrophe, as many ancient civilizations fell, or at least became highly crippled, and new groups such as the Greeks began a millennium-long rise to ascendancy. And with this catastrophe also came the end of the Bronze Age and the beginning of the Iron Age. And originally, iron weapons and tools began to be produced in what was be known as the Balkan regions of Europe. But with the movements of the Sea People, these iron weapons and tools began spreading all throughout the Near East. So, after the reign of Merenephtha of Egypt, the Sea People 
stopped fighting the Egyptians and moved out to the east and settled in the coastal plains of the Levant. And particularly, this is the plain where the Philistines were said to already be, according to the early chapters of Genesis. And this series of events has led biblical scholars to question two main factors of the Bible story. One, are the sea people really the Philistines, or did they just settle in Philistine lands and become kind of one huge super people group with the earlier Philistines that were there taking on their culture and language? And this is an important question because, as we've noted, the book of Genesis pictures the Philistines already in the land by the time of Abraham, but there's very little archaeological proof that Philistine culture is in those areas until about 12,000 or 1200 BC when the Sea People arrive. Now, the second question that comes up is, did the Sea People invent the mass production of iron weapons and armor, or was it already a technology that was in use and they just happened to bring it with them? Well, this question comes up because the Philistines clearly have the market cornered on iron weapons during the reign of King Saul, and this would give them a distinct military advantage. Culturally speaking, the Philistines will be the first culture to reach the Iron Age in the Levant, and the result is that this group became a militaristic superpower all up and down the Levant coast. And this can be seen in numerous biblical passages. For example, when the Israelites are journeying from the Sinai desert to the Promised Land, the Lord specifically takes them the long way around so that they bypass Philistine territory. And God says he is specifically doing that so that they will not lose heart by fighting too many battles, according to Exodus 13:17. Likewise, in Joshua chapter 13, the entire land of the Philistines is described as unconquered, meaning that even under Joshua's leadership, the Philistines put up a big enough fight to stay put in the land. And finally, at the very end of the Judges period, 1 Samuel 13, 19-22 reports that the Philistines successfully kept blacksmithing technology out of the hands of the Israelites, forcing them to have to journey down to Philistine territory and pay money if they wanted their iron tools sharpened. And these scriptures demonstrate that the Philistines had a technologically superior culture and that it would require divine intervention on God's part if the Israelites were going to successfully battle such a well-equipped people. So now, when it comes to religion, the Philistines were not great innovators. In fact, most of the gods that the Bible describes the Philistines worshipping are the very same gods the Canaanites are already worshipping. So Baal, Shamash, Asherah, they can all be found among the Philistine pantheon as well. However, there is one god, a lesser Canaanite god of grain, who seems to have been elevated to a, a place of some importance to the Philistines, and that is the pagan god Dagon. And some scholars have even argued that Dagon became so important to the Philistines that he was the head of their pantheon, or the father of the gods, even more so than Baal. Now, in Philistine artwork, Dagon is often pictured as a half-man, half-fish, and the Philistines managed to build a rather impressive temple to him down in the town of Ashdod. Now, like Baal, Dagon is a fertility god, indicating that the most significant theological question going through the minds of both the Philistines and the Canaanites is this, will the god send us enough rainwater, and will we be able to produce enough food to survive? This is the question of their religion. Can our fertility gods provide the goods year after year? Now, possibly the most amusing biblical account involving the Philistines' version of Dagon can be found in 1 Samuel 5, verses 1-5. through 5. Here, the Philistines have captured the Ark of the Covenant after the Battle of Ebenezer, and as a trophy, they've placed this Ark in the Temple of Dagon. Now, you might be asking, what are the Philistines trying to do or trying to show by doing this? Well, many scholars have speculated that it was common among pagan nations that when you captured the idols of a defeated people, you would hold these idols hostage and you would place them in the temple of a rival god, thus basically having a god keep an eye on this defeated god. And in a uh, surprisingly ironic chapter, this plan does not go well for the Philistines. Uh, they come to the temple of Dagon the next day. They find the idol has been knocked over. They set it back upright. They come back the day after that. The temple has been knocked over. The head has been severed. And the hands have been smashed off the idol. 
basically making Dagon bow and worship before the Ark. And it is also ironic that the Israelite people were in a fairly sinful condition when they went into that battle where they lost the Ark, and they were not able to stand before the might of the Philistines. But God, with no army at all, just a, a golden box sitting in a temple, begins to decimate the Philistines so terribly that after a few weeks, they're willing to send the ark back, admitting that they could not stand before Israel's God. So, be on the lookout for things like this throughout the biblical text. Once you know what a pagan culture's beliefs are and how they work, you will often be able to see how Israel's prophets and even God himself will use those beliefs to challenge their status quo. So the books of 1st and 2nd Samuel record the most interactions between Israel and the Philistines. And the majority of these meetings are skirmishes and pitched battles. And the Bible specifically records that there's an 80-year period between about 1050 BC and 970 BC where there's pretty much war every year between the Philistines of the Philistine pentapolis and the two first two kings of Israel, Saul and David. Now, thematically, all of these stories will follow the same pattern. Step one, there's always an acknowledgement that the Philistines are stronger than the Israelites militarily. Step two, there's a general sense that there's fear in the Israelite army, and most of the times when they go up to fight the Israelites, they do so realizing that they're probably going to get trounced. Step three, a hero almost always rises up, and because of his bravery and faith in the Lord, he succeeds. And this will happen numerous cases with Saul, with Saul's son Jonathan, and with David, and with many of David's mighty men later in David's career. But let's just take one of those for example. When David takes on Goliath, Goliath is a much, much bigger person than David. He is armed with a more impressive set of Iron Age weapons, and he is boastful that there's no Israelite that can take him in one-on-one -on -one combat, and he finds no one to uh, step up to his challenge for many days. David arrives on the scene, he rises to the challenge, and he turns down Saul's weapons and armor, and offers instead to take a slingshot with five stones. David's response to Goliath's superiority and, t and Iron Age technology is to bring Stone Age weapons. Goliath realizes the insult, he lets his guard down, and David makes short work of him with a single stone. And this pattern we'll see repeated over and over again in the biblical narratives. The faith of the Israelites and their obedience to the law of God is the only true indicator of whether or not they will be successful in battle. Now, where the Philistines are concerned in the story of King Saul, Israel's first king, we find that Saul is an abject failure following this paradigm. From 1 Samuel 13 onward, he begins breaking more and more of God's laws. First, he starts with breaking the prohibition that non-Levites are not allowed to offer sacrifice. He refuses to wait for Samuel to come and offer the sacrifice. After that, he fails to follow through in performing the haram on the Amalekites. He doesn't destroy any of the um, plunder, nor does he destroy the king of the Amalekites. And then finally, he starts resorting to murdering innocent people like the priest of Nob. And the last straw is when he resorts to necromancy because God is no longer responding to his prayers at all. And because of all of this snowball of sin, Saul is eventually killed in battle by the hands of the Philistines. And during the monarchy period, basically from David all the way to the end of the Israelite monarchy, that we'll see this is the trend for evil Israelite kings. God will deliver them over to the hands of their enemies, and they will frequently be defeated in battle. And this entire paradigm is based on Deuteronomy chapter 28, which promises economic and military blessings for obedience to God's law, but promises military ruin as a curse. For disobedience. For this reason, the books of 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel, the books of 1 and 2 Kings, the books of 1 and 2 Chronicles, and also the books of Joshua and Judges are often called the Deuteronomic history because they specifically use laws and the reward system given in the book of Deuteronomy to judge whether or not Israel's rulers are effective 
and whether or not Israel is obeying their covenant. Now, the Deuteronomic paradigm also creates a certain amount of cognitive dissonance when it comes to the reality that in Israel there's a mixture of righteous people and wicked people. And so, what happens to the righteous people who are being ruled by evil kings? If the blessings and curses of Deuteronomy are being met out fairly, we'd expect that the righteous people always get rewarded, the wicked people constantly get punished. But more often than not, this isn't the case, as the righteous end up suffering alongside the wicked, often because the wicked are being punished, the righteous suffer with them. And we see this frequently where the case of a single king can spell disaster for his entire nation, you know, regardless of the faithfulness of the people. For example, David spends much of his life on the run from King Saul. David is, at this point, fairly innocent, but yet he spends the latter part of Saul's reign living as an exile, hiding in the wilderness. Likewise, David commits sin by numbering his people, and the angel of death kills 70,000 people in Jerusalem. Furthermore, the prophet Habakkuk asks God directly, why is he allowing a wicked nation like Babylon to conquer Israel, who is comparatively mild in their wickedness? Now, when we see this kind of problem come up, this is a type of biblical literature known as theodicy. And it all stems from the problem that the righteous suffer along with the wicked, and we need an explanation for why does this happen. So, shifting gears one more time, let's talk about one final people group today. Let's talk about the Phoenicians. This group is particularly hard to nail down because technically they're a Canaanite, but they're a special brand of Canaanite. So what sets the Canaanites apart? Well, the Phoenicians are a group that lives in the cities along the northern coast of the Levant. And because they are these coastal, sea-going cities, they will become quite wealthy and powerful because of the overseas trade and the exploration and, and use of overseas resources. Now, the five major Phoenician cities I'd like you to be familiar with are these. The cities of Akko, Tyre, Sidon, Ugarit, and Byblos. These are the central hubs of Phoenician activity, and they'll be that way basically from the Bronze Age onward. So, unlike the other Canaanites who were in direct competition with the Israelites for the Promised Land, the Phoenicians dwelt primarily on the outskirts of Israel's tribal allotments. And this meant that they were close enough to be an influence, but distant enough not to be a constant military threat. And this will create a somewhat weird situation for the Phoenicians, as they are technically Canaanites, but they'll frequently trade and form alliances with Israel. One example of this is the sort of relationship was pursued by Solomon when he took several Phoenician wives in order to establish alliances with Phoenician cities. Additionally, Solomon reached a business agreement with Hiram, the king of Tyre, and where he would exchange cedar for food so that Solomon could build his palace and his temple. And this export of Cedar wood is one of the most important Phoenician resources that we see mentioned in the Bible, and this will make the trees of Lebanon famous. And the reason for all of this is that in the southern areas of the Levant, even places that are technically Mediterranean zones and receive a good amount of rain, there just isn't enough rain to grow very large trees. But once you start moving north to the highlands of Lebanon and the highlands of Galilee, we get much more rainfall, sometimes 40 inches or more, and finally large evergreen trees and even cedars can begin to grow. So another natural resource that the, Ph the Phoenicians managed to capitalize on is a small mollusk known as a sea hare. And this mollusk lives in shallow waters, and they have ink glands, kind of like a squid or an octopus. And because these creatures routinely washed up on the shore, the Phoenicians realized quickly that this ink gland could be used to dye wool. And it could be used to dye wool a reddish-purple color. And this, per this color purple became known as royal purple, 
or even Tyrian purple because the city of Tyre was the biggest manufacturer of purple cloth in the ancient world. And because of this, purple became a symbol of royalty and nobility. In many of the king descriptions we see in the Old Testament, if you wanted to know if the king was wealthy or powerful, you would just simply say, he dressed in purple. And this was often a sign that the king was very well to do. And also some nobles, for example, Dam Daniel will receive permission to wear purple from the foolish king Belshazzar for just a day, but it's the day before the Persians invade, invade Babylon and assassinate Belshazzar in his sleep. And so purple will become a sign of royalty, and it'll also be a sign of affluence because you would have to go to one of these coastal cities and trade with them to get the cloth to make a purple garment. Now, in the New Testament, all four, all four Gospels attest that a purple robe is placed on Jesus after his trial when he's being beaten and mocked by the Roman soldiers, and they're mocking him specifically because of his claim to be king of the Jews. Now, it's uncertain how the soldiers had access to a fine purple robe, only to ruin it with a prisoner's blood, but their point of their taunt was made, and it was vicious. This man claims to be king of the Jews? Let's see how well he wears his robes and crown. Now, as we said earlier, the Phoenicians maintained a relatively safe distance from the centers of Israelite control, so they didn't engage in constant warfare with the Israelites as the Philistines and the inland Canaanites did. And once King Solomon comes to power, he will start to establish a practice of marrying Phoenician princesses. And this, of course, will have a detrimental effect as these women who are now living in Jerusalem with Solomon would often demand that Solomon build them a shrine so that they could go worship their gods in private. And as a result, the biblical text notes that Solomon's heart was led astray by his own foreign wives. If you want to read more on this, see 1 Kings chapter 11, 1 through 3. And this problem will reach its zenith around the reign of King Ahab, who is the son of Omri. Ahab married a, Phoen a Phoenician princess named Jezebel in order to solidify an alliance with her father, Ethbaal, the king of Sidon. Now, when Jezebel comes and moves to Samaria to be with her husband, Jezebel is going to bring 400 prophets of Baal with her. And before too long, Ahab is not only committing the syncretism sins of his previous forebearers, but he's now going to be actively engaged in worshiping Baal outright. And he'll even go so far as to build a temple of Baal and a sacred grove to Asherah. And you may be asking right now, how come did Ahab cave in in a way that he, the other kings of Israel before him had not? Well, there's two fairly frequent answers given to this. The first is that Jezebel was a beguiling and persuasive sort of person and simply rolled her husband down a slippery slope until he was caught up in Baal worship and there was no escape. But the second theory, and I find this a little bit more compelling, is that the Baal cult required priestly participation from the king. And because Ahab came from an Israelite, he would have known that he couldn't perform true priestly duties according to the law of Moses. There is a separation, shall we say, of church and state between the duties of the king and the duties of the priest. Well, if Ahab started worshiping Baal, the Baal cult would have allowed Ahab to act as priest and king. And this would have given him more control over the religion of his people if he could just get them to worship a god that allowed him to be both priest and king. And this problem was so significant that God raised up two very popular prophets, Elijah and his successor Elisha, to combat the menace of Baal brought about by Ahab and Jezebel. And, well, the results of their ministry are varied. Elijah and Elisha did certainly pronounce judgment upon all of these practices. And they frequently put Baal and these evil kings and queens in their place. But the net result is that Baal worship never fully disappeared after them. 
it could never be eradicated from the land of Israel, and it would not be until 722 that the Assyrians will finally wipe out this problem by simply wiping out the kingdom of Israel in general. Now, I know what you're thinking. Professor Corey, your slides are saying we're looking at the exports of the Phoenicians. How did they export a god like Baal? Well, you're right. You can move cedar logs and you can ship purple cloth in a way that's different from religion. But, to be honest, they exported their religion the same way that Christians do it. Evangelism and colonization. Evangelism could be seen in the works of Jezebel or the wives of Solomon. They simply establish a relationship with, his, with an Israelite person, and before too long, that person is also worshipping Baal. But colonization was also a major tool of Phoenician expansion of their religion. You see, the Phoenicians had access to quite a lot of wood, as we pointed out. And with that wood, they made a huge fleet to set sail all throughout the Mediterranean world. And everywhere they settled, they brought their god Baal with them. So, from about the time of 1000 BC onward, the Phoenicians started colonization efforts, and by the time of the New Testament, Phoenician cities could be found all the way as far as Spain or Tunisia, or even, even southern France. And just for one example, you may remember hearing about the Punic Wars, either from your high school history class or from a college Western civilization class. And there were three of these wars fought, and they were fought between the city of Carthage and the city of Rome. Well, in that second war, the Carthaginians had an elephant-riding general named Hannibal. Well, that's the way you would pronounce it in English. The Phoenician way to pronounce his name is Hannibal. That's right. Just like Jezebel's father, F. Baal, the god Baal was so important to the city of Carthage that people would begin naming their children after him. And what this also meant is that the entire Canaanite religion was coming eastward, or, or sorry, coming westward into the Mediterranean basin, and so detestable practices such as child sacrifice to the god Mote would survive well into the Roman period because these Phoenicians were willing to export their religion everywhere they went. So now, the major place where the Phoenicians will intersect with the biblical text is with the ministry of the prophet Elijah. And from start to finish, Elijah's ministry is going to step up to the challenge of Baal worship. It's going to confront Ahab. It's going to confront Jezebel. It's going to confront the people. It's going to directly challenge the prophets of Baal. And I would like to note that most of his prophetic announcements are made that specifically challenge a particular god of the Phoenician pantheon. And we'll be looking at this in our next lecture when we do our presentation. But for now, it'll suffice to say that every time Elisha makes a challenge, he is going to specifically be focusing on a particular Phoenician or Canaanite god, and he is going to be directly showing how that god is powerless up against his god, Yahweh. Now, the other thing Elijah will do is he is going to call for the people to make a decision between Yahweh and Baal, that they are not 100% in it on either religion by this point. And he's going to basically be asking them time and time again, make a choice. Don't straddle the fence. Are you going to worship God or are you going to worship Baal? And it is notable that this will be the start of the movement away from the extermination of the, uh, of the Phoenicians and the Canaanites, because also during this time, uh, for example, in 1 Kings chapter 17, Elijah will spend an entire chapter of the Bible living with a Phoenician woman at Zarephath, ministering to her and helping her to see the truth of his religion. So, that was all of Israel's neighbors to the west and to the north. And we can say a couple firm conclusions at this point about the Canaanite culture. The first is that the Canaanite religion and Canaanite ideas spread to other people groups that were living to the west of the Israelites, particularly to the Philistines and the Phoenicians. In terms of their gods, they are all worshipping mostly the same gods, although some, like the Philistines, will place more importance on some gods more than others. 
But the bottom line is that Canaanite culture was very convincing and compelling to people living in the Levant. And we can see this time and time again that the people of Israel are constantly having to make a choice between worshiping the Lord their God and following his law or worshiping the Canaanites who are and their and their gods who are also promising things like rainfall and fertility. And so the big question will be which god actually produces true fertility? Which god actually produces true prosperity? And the rhetoric of the Bible will consistently be, it is the God of Israel, and the Canaanite gods are actually powerless. But again, even with the Bible constantly saying this, our second conclusion is that the Canaanite religion is a compelling religion to the Israelites, and it frequently caused them to stumble. And the three main reasons for this are these, that their cultures are so close together that all you have to do is go down to the Jezreel Valley or the Plain of Akko or the Philistine Plain, and you're going to find Canaanites or Philistines who are worshiping in this way. And so you don't have to go far to find these cultures. The second reason it's so compelling is the linguistic similarities, that many of the words that the Hebrews use from day-to-day -day life, sea, death, sun, were also the names of Canaanite gods, and it could be very easy to confuse a person. It might be very similar to what happens when, let's say, a Mormon missionary talks with a Christian, that they use a lot of the same words, but they mean very different things when these comparisons are made. And the biggest reason there's so much confusion between the average Israelite, between their parents' religion and the Canaanite religion, is simply the question of fertility. When a drought comes, are you going to say, I have sinned and repented? Or are you going to say, well, maybe Israel's God is just fickle, and maybe I should go looking to another God? And because the entire land is dependent on rainfall, this question of fertility will be a driving force all the way until the time of the all the way until the time of the exile. So that was our presentation on the Canaanites, the Philistines, and the Phoenicians. God bless you all, my friends, and we'll see you later.